All right, so I um, wanted to continue uh, talking about static electricity and its origins in the structure of the atom. And the first thing we learned is that everything in the world is made up of atoms and that the atom has protons and electrons in it, as well as some other things. The protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged. So there are two elements to electricity. Charges that are dissimilar, in other words, opposite, positive and a negative, they attract each other. A positive and a positive will repel, and a negative and a negative will um, also repel. So we learned that. We also learned that electrons are easily removed from atoms. So when you want to understand electricity, you just need to say, hey, where are the electrons going? And then we learned that too many electrons in an object would make the object itself negatively charged, and that too few electrons in the object would make the object itself positively charged. And so what we're going to use the terminology charge to mean an object that has been charged because it is missing or has too many electrons. Um, we also uh, kind of mentioned that uh, uh, there was a certain number uh, for the unit of charge. Uh, the unit of charge is the Coulomb, or capital C, and that one Coulomb represented a deficit or excess of a whole lot of electrons. If we turn this on its heel, the charge on one electron measured in Coulombs was 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs, and this is an important thing. So, first thing I want to say that's new is that because the charge on the electron is so small, or conversely, one unit coulomb is so many electrons, it turns out that we will often be talking about millicoulombs, microcoulombs, or even nanocoulombs of charge. It is very common to talk about small amounts of charge. Remember my anecdote that one coulomb of charge is enough to make you, um, you know, notice it. It make you say, "Ow!" Make you recoil your hand. Um, one coulomb of charge that could shock you, like when you shuffle your socks on the carpet and touch a doorknob or faucet. Um, that would destroy small electronics. If you had your uh, iPhone open and you were poking around and touching the chips inside and you discharged yourself into one of them, it would most likely destroy it. Uh, back in the bad old days of uh, assembling your own computers, and I, I have been told by some students that uh, people still do that to get the kind of performance they want. Um, you, you really had to be careful to ground yourself either with a special strap that went around your wrist and connected to the computer or by constantly touching the computer case before you opened sensitive electronics out of their packages and things like that because you could zap them and uh, make them not work even though you just spent $400 on a new graphics card. It don't work. Okay, so uh, next thing. Because we speak of small amounts of coulombs, um, there is a formula I want to give you. And the formula I want to give you is this. The charge on any object is equal to an integer number times the charge on one electron. And that's because charge is made up of having too few or too many electrons. And however many too few or too many you have, your total charge is that number times the elementary charge, the basic charge of one. This is equivalent to kind of a problem of partitioning. Uh, chemists use moles in the same way, but let's talk about it in terms of eggs. If I want to make the world's largest omelet and I need to know how many cartons of eggs to buy, it's a very simple operation. I simply take the number of eggs I need, let's say 400 eggs, and that's going to equal some number of the carton number, and the carton number is 12. There are 12 eggs in a carton. And so now this tells me, if in order to find out how many cartons I need, I need to divide 12 into the 400. And I agree that you probably could have done that by yourself because it is a practical thing. I've found that students, as soon as you start talking about something as nebulous as an electron, and especially since the number is a scientific notation number smaller than one, that this logic um, uh, fails us and we don't know how many cartons of eggs to buy to make our gargantuan omelet. So I give you this formula to help you with this. We can practice with this a little bit. This is something I'm going to ask you to calculate at least once. All right. 
last thing that I want to say is that um, uh, I want to talk about Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law is the force law for electricity. You know, we said that uh, like charges repel, uh, no, yes, and uh, the opposite charges attract, but how much do they attract and repel? <clears throat> Charles Augustine Coulomb is most famous for figuring that out. And he patterned his uh, law after the law of gravity that Isaac Newton came up with. Uh, by the way, I got to say some things. <clears throat> I told you that the the cartoon idea that Isaac Newton was hit in the head with an apple um, is kind of not only wrong, but also not beneficial because it makes you think that he thought of the concept of gravity, and that is ridiculous. People before Newton knew what gravity was. They had a word for it, and they probably had measured it in some sense. I think Galileo was in on that, but... Um, but they didn't understand its behavior, and Newton's contribution was to come up with the law that indicated how gravity behaved, what things did it depend on, and how did it get weaker as you moved up. That was his genius. He figured out that the gravity that caused the apple to fall to the earth in about a second is actually weaker by the time it gets to the moon. That's why the moon doesn't fall to the earth in a... Uh, a commensurate amount of time, you know, one second or half, what have you. So um, it's weaker, and so the moon is falling towards the Earth much more slowly, giving us a chance to establish an orbit, whether you think of that as the moon is falling towards the Earth, but the Earth keeps moving out of the way, or that the moon is falling towards the Earth, but it has some horizontal or tangential motion as well, however you want to think of orbits, but he figured it out. And the thing that he figured out is the thing that Coulomb used as well, that the thing gets weaker as the distance between the things squared on the bottom of a fraction. Now, what goes on the top of a fraction? Well, a constant to make the units work out. And then in Coulomb's law, we're going to multiply both of the charges, maybe a proton and an electron, or a charged object that's positive and another charged object that's positive. Whatever it is, we're going to multiply those two charges together. Coulombs times Coulombs. Okay? And then we're going to divide by how far apart they are, but that how far apart gets squared. The shape of this law is the same as the shape of many, many, many laws. And what's really interesting about it is this R squared distance dependence. Almost everything in the universe depends uh, on R squared in the denominator, meaning that things get smaller if you get further away. Light gets less intense if you get further away. Radiation gets less intense if you get further away. Sounds get quieter if you get further away. And it's a square of the distance, meaning if you double your distance, that 2 that you would put in the denominator gets squared and becomes a 4, you will suffer one quarter of the radiation dose. That's what they taught me when I was a radiation safety worker. If you see a spill or something, get away. If you can triple your distance, 3 goes in the denominator, it gets squared one ninth of the radiation dose, which is why they say on certain things that are radioactive, they have a little sticker on there that says, do not eat. Because if you eat them, you cannot change your distance from them. They are inside you. You will get all, all of the radiation. Um, so let me tell you how to read one of these. Anything on the top of the fraction is a direct proportionality, directly proportional. Meaning, if Q goes up, F goes up. If the other Q goes up, F goes up. If Q and the other Q go up, F really goes up. If we double this Q, put a 2 in front of it, there will be twice the force. Leave this one alone, put a 2 in front of that one, twice the force. If you put a 2 in front of both of them, 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times the force. So directly proportion. However much you increase the com combination here, the force will be increased. Anything on the bottom of a fraction like this is an inverse proportionality. And in this case, it's an inverse square proportion. So as we said, double the distance. You have to square that two to get four, one quarter of the force. Okay, so now you're going to do a little worksheet and um, turn that in. And that will serve as our little miniature lecture for the day. I have given you a look at Coulomb's Law and told you what a direct proportion and an inverse proportion are. I pointed out that the inverse proportion is an inverse square proportion. Watch out for that. And I've given you a formula that can help you if you lose your way trying to figure out whether to multiply or divide when trying to figure out how many electrons are involved in creating a charged object. Also, I did remind you or tell you that we will often be using small amounts of coulombs when we do any kind of math. And I, I did, again, 
well, this is part of the review, but I, this is a very important part of the review, that the charge on one electron is a very small number. The next lecture will tell you how we know that number. It's a very elegant and interesting experiment, and um, I will leave it here.